Now, I can say that I want you to live happy ever after, but uh, that's, you know, not really important. God wants you to live happy ever after. Uh, the day that you marry that most beautiful girl that you ever knew, and she becomes your wife, God wants you to live happy ever after. Now, you will live happy ever after unless you break the laws of God. That's right. You will live either till you die or, or go to heaven uh, by the rapture. You'll live happy un unless you transgress against God. As long as you both love each other, just as you did before you were married, giving to each other very strongly of each other, as you did before you were married, if you do the same after you're married, as you did before you're married, you will live happy ever after. Now, this is quite a series of uh, lessons on living happy ever after. It has to do with a, with a family home. It began with living happy ever after, which was our first one. The birth of the human family, how it all started. You have to go back to the beginning. And then what is family life? We've already given you that in today's lesson, the three worlds of marriage. This is one we want you to really pay attention to. Because if you start out wrong, the possibilities are <laughs> it'll stay wrong your chances of getting it right are not as great as if you start out right. And so uh, we would just be happy for you to start out right and do it right, and then it will certainly all be right. We'd like for you to gather with us around the table, Mrs. Summerall and I, and we'll talk to you about how to do it right. And I'm, I'm sure that you will enjoy it and appreciate it. I hope this lesson is very exciting for you, as exciting as it is for us. And uh, three worlds of marriage. <laughs> Ah, well now, young lady, if you were to do it over, would you, would you marry the same guy? Oh, uh, there's no doubt about it. Would you really? Not saying that. Uh, you hadn't had some I should problems. say that <laughs> that I'm not <laughs> perfect, and neither are you perfect. No. Well, okay. uh, I think we understand that. All right. But uh, then it's to know how to uh, get together and uh, to be molded with each other's. Uh, nature and uh, their, their uh, I was going to say whims and especially fancies. Especially if one belongs to the British Empire and the other belongs to the Yankee Doodles. You know, uh, well, being yes. born in Canada and I was born in the southern part of the United mm -hmm. States, for those two to get together is a uh, now, I didn't, I didn't make fun of you being an American, and you certainly didn't make fun of uh, me being a Canadian. No, Did we... No, we we're, were human beings. Yeah, that's right. And they, we have to keep it on God's, that basis. God's creation. Uh, otherwise, you don't have true happiness. That's right. In today's lesson, uh, it has to do with the three, the three worlds of marriage. And in Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, Can two walk together except they be... Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> that seems to be the nucleus of this thing. Well, yes, because it's uh, it's uh, almost impossible if they're not. That I mean, they might go along for a little while, but yet something will come up and mm. there will be trouble. Mm. But when you're in Christ Jesus, uh, that makes a whole difference. Of course, great? I suppose they're in the world, even those who don't know Christ as their personal Savior as we, there are uh, uh, temperaments and, and they're just their nature where they give, they give. Uh, each one. They understand they the they principles, understand. the principles of married life, and they live by those principles, and they live together. That's that's, that's what makes a happy marriage. I think even the, some of the heathen do that. You know, they understand the principles of living together, and they they abide by those. You break those principles, mm -hmm. they're, they're they're Christians that go out after divorce because they don't understand those principles of living together. And when they understand them, then it's easier to live together. Certainly. Yeah, as long as you're trying to make somebody else over. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna have some work on your hands. Because um, <laughs> we all know within ourselves that we're not perfect, but you don't like the other person to bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to keep your imperfections to yourself. Yes. <laughs> all right. If you permit me to, we'll go across and talk to the folks about this, and we're going to answer some very interesting questions. That should a Christian marry an unbeliever? Uh, if if unbelievers marry and one partner is later converted, what should they do about it? We got some very exciting questions that we're answering for these people. And I'm sure this is going to be a very, uh, very important series that you're doing this time. And if you'll go with me, neighbors, we'll cross over here a little little distance away and and uh, and, and give up our eating and, and, and get in busy here with you and talk to you about uh, the, the three worlds of marriage, which is going to be very exciting. But first, we're going to answer some questions uh, for you. Man has complicated his life 
And uh, usually this complication, it, it comes about through transgression. The complications of life normally come because of transgression, uh, or you call it sin. Um, when you find a problem, normally you'll find the devil close by, <laughs> and sin and transgression. And if we can get rid of that, uh, the complications uh, get straightened out, and, and you can see exactly what you should do. The, the first question that was asked me in this, in this series was, uh, should a Christian marry an unbeliever? Now, I think if you went back to the Old Testament, you'd find that God would not permit his, his uh, people of Israel to marry with the pagans. Now, the, the reason was that for the, was for the next generation. You might love the woman that you're going to marry, but uh, how, how about the children? What would they be? Would they be half pagan and, and, and half uh, Israelite, or what would they be? And so God said it wasn't well, and he, he had strict laws against it, even death, even death, uh, for intermarriage. And so even back in the Old Testament, God wanted to keep the bloodstream pure and wanted to cre keep those that were faithful to God. Now, if you were like Ruth, if you were like Ruth and you uh, said, well, now, wait a minute here, I am going to be uh, a believer after you, and then that was a pagan becoming a Christian, then, uh, or a believer, that, that would certainly be acceptable, and that would be all right. But if you are, a, uh, if you are already a Christian, and you marry an unbeliever, then the Bible has something to say about it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, you better open your Bible to that. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. Uh, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And then it says in, the, in verse 15, the, the next verse, And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or the devil? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Yeah, how, how strong is that, you know? You couldn't get it any stronger. Un, unequally yoked together with believers and unbelievers. What fellowship can you have, righteousness and unrighteousness? What communion can you have with light and dark, light and darkness has no communion. When you turn on a switch and there's light, uh, then there is no darkness. It's, it's gone. So they, they, they have no relationships one to the other. What concord hath Christ with the devil? None, none, none at all. There's no fellowship there at all. What part is he that believeth with an infidel? You just simply don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> yeah, that's what you have to understand. You simply don't have anything to talk about uh, when you've got an infidel talking to a believer. You can't keep God out of your talk, and you can't keep eternity out of your talk, and being a human. And so, uh, you've got a problem on your hand. And, and the Bible says it before you got here. The Bible's been saying this for 2,000 years. It didn't just say it for this generation. Verse 16 says, And what, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now, the Bible says that we are the temples of the Most High God. It says, well, what what do you have with someone else that their body is a temple of idols, of demon worship? He says, what agreement do you have between two things like that? Or in a physical way, what agreement has a house of worship with a house full of, uh, of dumb idols? That eyes and can't see and ears and can't hear and a mouth and can't speak. Uh, what agreement is there between the two? Uh, then there is simply no agreement uh, whatsoever. Now, God has already said this. And if you're going to disobey God, the, 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 the catastrophes that I've known through this are, are overwhelming. I, uh, as a boy, I remember that uh, a young man, I remember that our pastor's daughter, when she turned about 15 or 16, she ran off with a man that she had only known for a few hours, although his parents did come to the church. Uh, ran off, he just got out of the Navy, and they ran off together, and uh, the father, her father, the, pre the pastor, couldn't even find them, and they were hidden for a few days, and, uh, and, and so he couldn't stop the wedding, he couldn't annul it because they'd already lived together for a few days and didn't know whether she was pregnant or not and so forth. And I presume she was pregnant because she had uh, four or five or six children. All they had was hell. He beat her. He knocked her around. She lived with her father about half the time because he wouldn't have her around. And, and she just went through hell. And, and one Christmas, they were separated, and uh, they were eating Christmas dinner with, them, with her mother and her father and her children. And, and this husband that she married walked in, and he, he walked in with a big knife in his hand and said, I'm going to cut every one of you 
uh, to pieces on this Christmas day. So he had a drawn knife, and, and the father, who was a preacher, he was more than just a pastor. He was a superintendent of a whole state. Uh, he stood up, and he got himself a gun, and he shot his son-in-law. I don't think he meant to kill him, but he did. Hit him right through the heart, and he dropped dead. And there on Christmas Day, which was in the newspapers all over the country, a minister had to kill a boy, a man now, uh, because of his daughter and because of his grandchildren. Now, that's what that screwball little girl did, you see. Jumped up and married a fellow that she'd only met for a few days and, and uh, went running off and, and, and eloped with him. And, and the hell, the literal hell that she went through for the next number of years, uh, it's unspeakable. It's unspeakable. And that's when the, when the Bible says, what agreement hath the temple of God with the temple of idols? There is no agreement there. Uh, what agreement is there between a believer and a young believer? Unbe there is no agreements there. And what fellowship is there with righteous and unrighteous? There, there, there is no fellowship there. So it says, God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, you see, that means that God says for you to keep your temple separate, to keep your, your bodies of the temples of the Most High God, the Bible says, you've got to keep it separate in order to be what God wants you to be. And so I don't care who you are or how it makes you feel, the Bible implicitly says, explicitly says, that you must not marry an unbeliever that if, if they don't want to receive the same God you have, you shouldn't get mixed with them because the Bible says the two become one. You see? The two become one. And how can, how can the two become one? You know? They don't become one. If you, if you had a gallon of beautiful milk here and you put a gallon of dirt in it, what you got? You've got nothing, you see. Uh, and, and you cannot mix that which belongs to God and that which does not belong to God. And the next verse says, uh, Wherefore, come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. God will not receive people who break his laws, who break his covenant, who do those things that deliberately that he, he says don't do it, and then God will not put his blessing upon it nor his help upon it in any way. Now, our next question that has been asked is this. If unbelievers marry... They're both unbelievers. They're both sinners. They marry. And later, later, one partner uh, becomes converted to the, Lord, to the Lord Jesus Christ. What should be his attitude toward his unconverted mate? Now, his mate is not saved, has not given their hearts to God. But they, it all began uh, when both of them were unconverted. We find literally thousands uh, of this type of situation. Two young people, neither of them knew God. And later, one of them come to know God. What should be the attitude of the one toward the one ha that has not found God? All right, open your Bible there now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, it says, Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, Jehovah. Let not the wife depart from her husband. And so you have no right to depart from your husband because you've gotten saved and he's not saved. Or the other way, because he's gotten saved and you're not saved yet. One of the outstanding men in our pulpits in America today that everyone in this country knows, uh, uh, he and his wife were both sinners, and, and he got saved, <laughs> and she just left, you know, and, and we'll show you what the Bible says about that. She says, I just don't want to be with a religious person. I want to gamble, and I want to drink, and I want to have parties all night, and, and, and said, so that's what we were when we, when we got married. That's what we were always going to be. And he says, oh, no, I've come into a new life. And she said, well, you have it all by yourself. And she left him. And, and so she has a right to do that, according to the Bible. But uh, you that find the Lord, uh, you don't have that right. Uh, you, you must stay with her. Let not the wife depart from an unconverted husband. Verse 11 says, but if she depart, now, now that means that, uh, uh, just like the story I just told you, that if she can't uh, reconcile herself to live with a godly man and a good man and a clean man and a holy man, she wants to go with, with, with filth and uncleanness and dissipation, uh, then it says, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Verse 12 says, The rest I speak, I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not. I notice what it says, a brother has a wife that doesn't believe. So that means a, a man that's born again, and he has a woman that does not believe, she is not born again, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. 
uh, that that concludes that point. You see, that uh, if you if if you're saved and your companion is not saved and they love you and want to stay with you, you're not to leave them over religious re reasons. You're not to do that if they're loving you and taking care of you and not beating you and and not going out committing adultery and so forth. They just want to stay with you. Then you're not to leave them over religious re reasons. I'm better than you and I love God. And you don't. I'm leaving. You must not do that. And and God forbids you to do that. <clears throat> And then we read in verse 13 that the husband, that, and the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Now that's pretty good English, you know, you can, you can understand that real easy, I'm sure. And it means exactly what it says. And so let's follow the Lord. In verse 14, it says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Now that is certainly one of the mysteries of God. And I think it was in my own home. Uh, my mother was a Christian 20 or 30 years before my father became a Christian. And our home was sanctified. And we, we turned out three uh, men that were preachers and, and, one, and, and one daughter that's a preacher uh, out, of, out of that family. And, and they all went preaching before the father got saved. And so it says the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. By the goodness of my mother, the kindness of my mother, of living in this kind of situation, uh, there, there was a sanctification in that family. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband. Now, isn't God to put, good to put stuff like that in the Bible so that you can follow the Bible in the emergencies of life, in the great stresses of life, in the great strains of life, in the great problems of life? God has the answer. Now, if you rebel, you'll be just like Adam. Adam rebelled, and he, 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 he was sorry for it the rest of his life. And so you must not rebel. In verse 15, it says, If the unbelieving depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. And that means if they just can't stand you, uh, then, of course, uh, you can say, well, then, then you can go. How long should a Christian persevere in trying to win a, married, uh, a marriage partner to God? I would say your total life your total life. You've gotten yourself into the thing, and if they want to stay with you, you should not leave them. You should keep trying to get them saved. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter, chapter 7 and verse 12, it says, The rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, she be pleased to dwell with him. Let him not put her away. The woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if she be pleased, let him not leave her. And so we have strict orders of just exactly how to handle uh, such a question as that. And we'd like for all of us to say, Brother Summerall, I'm going to do what God says do. What are some of the ways you'd recommend to win an unsaved marriage partner? Number one, believe God for it. Number two, pray for it constantly. And number three, place good literature around where they can find it in convenient places and read it. Invite them to special events not your regular meetings that would possibly irritate them, but to special events, special speakers, and then show a real spiritual Christian attitude in the home. By all means, don't nag every day, and don't throw up things to them that, they're, that are very disagreeable. Don't keep mentioning uh, their unbelief and their going to hell of their sins and their shortcomings and so forth. Don't persistently beg them to do something that they don't want to do, but pray with them that God will do it. Now, as this lesson says, there are actually three. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, it says, Man has a spirit, a soul, and a body. And uh, uh, millions of people only get married in the body. My flesh wants your flesh. I demand your flesh. I cry out for your flesh. And the two pieces of flesh get married. Now, before they are married for any great length of time, the flesh runs out. They get weary of the flesh. They get sick of the flesh. They get mad at the flesh. And they said, well, the only way out of this is a divorce. And so they proceed to the divorce courts because they got married in one area, but every human being is made up of three. You are a spirit, a soul, and a body. There are three parts of you, and if you get married in just one of them, you've got two parts left out that's going to cause you trouble one day. Now, there's some people that are a little smarter than that, and they don't get married uh, just in the body, uh, but they also get married in the soul. Now, your soul, uh, your soul is your mind, it is your, your emotions, and it is your will. Uh, that, that is your soulical parts. And so those people say, listen, you think like I do. Let's get married. Uh, you have the same kind of emotions I have. Uh, let's get married. Uh, you have the same kind of a will that I have. You're not stubborn. 
you're easy to get along with. So they get married in their soulical parts. And they also say, and also beside that, you're pretty. And so they get married in the, in the soul and in the body. But I want you to know uh, right now that the most problems that we discover people having when, they, when their family disintegrates is in their spirit. You can have the bodily things all right. You can have the soulical things all right. But in their spirit, you are a spirit. Now, you say, how should a person get married? Number one, if a young man or a young woman wants to get married, the first thing they should do is to find a person that loves the same God they love. Go to the same kind of church that they go to. Loves the same kind of music that they like. Loves the same kind of a worship service. Some like it uh, soft and some like it loud. It, you, you should first marry someone that is an adjustment to you in the world of spirit. Because you, you are a spirit. And it's so important. Very few people get married by their spirit. Does God want me to do this? Does God want me to have this person? Is God telling me to marry this person? Am I lusting after the flesh? To have this person? Or is my spirit reaching out for a combination that God puts together? Oh, it's a difference when God puts two together and when you come together some other way. So if you do that, then from that point, yes, you do fit into God's pattern. Now let's look at the second point, and that's the soul part. Do they have the same kind of a mind? Now just because you're a Christian, you don't have to go marry a dunce. Yeah, you marry a brilliant person. And so after you have found out the spirit part is right, they love the same God you love. They don't worship idols. Uh, they, they don't hate God. They're not an infidel. Get your adjustment first in the spirit because you are primarily a spirit. And then move into the soul. Do they think like I do? Do they have the same emotions? Are they up and down and up and down? If they are, you're going to have trouble. Even though, even though they're all right in the spirit part of you, belong to the same church, if they are wrong emotionally, you're going to have trouble, you see. So the second place you want to look is to see what kind of mind they have in thinking, thinking things through, thinking things out. You've got to do business, you know. You've got to have a home, you know. And, and, and you're, you've got to have a mind in order to have a successful marriage. And then after that, uh, you, you have a, a successful uh, emotions. That your emotions flow together, not down in the dumps with a long face with a grouchy. You can't be happy in a home with that kind of a person. Look at the solo book, solo parts, and look, look into, the, into the will part of you. If they're stubborn as an ox, I won't budge. Well, how are you going to have a happy home with people like that around? And then after you have gone through the solo parts of the mind, the emotions, and the will, then you can make a further decision. Are they pretty enough that I want to live with them? I mean, if they're about that tall, you don't want to go around with a shorty all your life. Or if they're about seven foot tall, you don't want to go around with a longie all your life, you see? And so there are some physical aspects. Are they real pretty? Or you don't want anybody pretty, you know? Uh, there's some decisions to make. But if you begin those decisions at the wrong place, if you begin those decisions in the flesh, you're going to have a problem. If that is number one, I love your face. I, I love your soft flesh. I want to eat it up. I'm just telling you one thing. You're going to get sick of it and vomit it out. You're not going to want it. And if you get married just in the soul, oh, you've got, a, you've got a clever mind. Oh, I like your emotions. You're in high G. Oh, I like your willpower, man. You stand up against them. Well, one day you'll be standing up against you, too. If you begin in the spirit, you know, and, and choose first from God's viewpoint, and then from there you move into the second, with God helping you, and find one of the same mind, of the same emotions, of the same will. And then after that, one with the same size body, if you want one like that. <laughs> and, and one with the right color hair, if you want that. Uh, if yours is black, and there's a black, and yours is red, and there's a red. Whatever you like, and the same size. Then uh, you move into the third element. But the physical area is different. And, and I want you to know that. It cannot be first, it has to be last. And if not, you're not in God's divine pattern. Now those are the three worlds of marriage. The three worlds of marriage are spirit, soul, and body. Now, if you will recognize that in God, because God said that's what you were, all the major decisions of your life should be made the same way. In the spirit, we first decide, does God want me to do this? Is this God's will? And then, does it work out all right according to my mind and my thinking and my emotions and my feeling and my willpower? And is it all right with my body? Can I do it? Every major decision that you have should be made the same way. And more especially, what creates a home. Father, bless these that have heard and, and help each one of us, Lord, to have happy homes. 
and those that at this moment are having problems, we curse those problems and we command them to go and we ask you to give, to give blessing. Let everyone right now be blessed. I command it. And let there be peace. And I, I cast lust away and I, I curse meanness, I curse meanness and call it to go away. And let the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanse us from all of our sins and give us happy, happy homes. I urge you to be a happy person in Jesus' name.